Um, walking behind me are three fantastic panelists, um, and we're going to breeze through some really insightful stuff of what's going on, um, both in the world of disruptive technologies uh, and also as they pertain to uh, the growth in Latin America. We're going to focus a little bit on Latin America in this session for a number of reasons. The first is that, obviously, um, we have the Festival of Media Latin America coming up, um, so we're thinking about that. But also, two other reasons. Obviously, the World Cup, the Olympics in Brazil, is drawing a huge amount of interest to the region. And also, the region itself, um, given the huge amounts of people there moving from, um, into, from one class, social class, into another, and the digital take-up happening, the things that are happening in Latin America are also analogous to the many of the changes that are happening across the global marketplace that brands are facing. So I'm delighted to welcome uh, three fantastic panelists. We've got Melissa Barnes. Uh, I'm sure many of you know Melissa. She runs the Global Agency Relationships for Twitter. Then on Melissa's left, we have Luke Sturtz, uh, who runs the marketing for Netflix um, in Latin America. And then finally, we have um, Marin Lau, who is the vice president of IMS, uh, one of Latin America's leading um, agencies and representation companies. Um, so uh, could you please give them a huge round of applause of welcome? Thank you. OK, now, look, we all know that, that panel discussions can be um, a little turgid sometimes. So we're going to try and uh, make it as, as interesting as possible. And I want you three people to give me and our delegates here as much statistical information as you possibly can, as much insight as you possibly can. So that's the rules, OK? Mm -hmm. Trying to avoid vague assertions. <laughs> we want fact, OK? So let's see what we can do. Um, well, first of all, congratulations on Twitter's seventh birthday. Thank you. Thank um, you. Now, I think what I'd be interested to, to know um, is you know, everyone's very excited about the consumer take-up of Twitter. Yep. This, the jury is still perhaps a little bit out on the brand building um, abilities of Twitter. I don't um, know that that's what we've seen. Go on. I, you know, we, um, we've, we've got a number of clients um, that have had real success on the platform. Um, I could give you, you know, names of CMOs of different auto companies that talk about how Twitter has sold more cars. Um, Mercedes recently did an activation in the UK that tied uh, TV and Twitter together. Um, and one in four people who participated expressed a desire to go into the dealership and learn more about the car. I mean, we're talking about a product that costs thousands of dollars. Um, so we've seen real impact. American Express, another great example, um, where there's been significant impact. Um, so in every category, we're seeing significant success. Um, your CEO, Dick Costolo, said recently that there's a roughly about 500 million tweets per day. Yep. Is that about right? Yeah. It's um, when events happen in the world, they happen on Twitter. And so um, we're seeing that people are talking about big and small. And yep. so um, part of the reason why we're excited about the Olympics, but um, an event could be a TV show. Yep. And so we've seen that play out in interesting ways. And just, just clarifying what your current user uh, base is, mm -hmm. you, you read anything from 200 million um, subscribers to Twitter to 288, I think was the latest guesstimate. Yep. Um, where, what exactly do you tell the marketplace in terms of your total user base? So our last um, public number was 200 million active users. That was announced in January to give you a sense of um, pace. Last January, we had 100 million active users. Um, so okay. we, are, we are growing quite quickly. Tell me the difference between uh, promoted tweets and promoted trends. And promoted trends seems to be pretty expensive to advertisers mm -hmm. at the moment, $200,000 mm -hmm. um, to actually get into the promoted trend listing. Yeah. How, sounds expensive. How, how do you justify the price? And, and tell, tell, tell us a little bit about how it works. I think promoted trends are a bargain. Okay. Well, um, you would say that. I would. <laughs> and I, I don't actually sit on the sales team. I, I, I can say that. Um, and actually, I had our brand advocacy team. Agency relations is part of that, but um, I don't want to take someone else's job or credit for the great job that he's doing. Um, so promoted trends, what we saw early on Twitter is people, you wanted to find out what people were talking about, right? And so you could look and see the conversations of the day. Um, we saw an opportunity for advertisers there, um, that if they could take that top spot, um, they, could, they could ignite a campaign, they could draw attention to a conversation that they wanted to start. 
um, or participate in. And, and that, was, that was an opportunity for them to take top billing. We've actually increased um, the, the cost of promoted trends because, um, because of supply and demand. Um, people want to own that. Um, and you can do it on a global level, but you can also do it country by country. Um, promoted tweets uh, take your organic content that you're already creating and, and promote it to uh, your followers, but also people who look like your followers. It's, it's a way to um, scale communications. Um, it's a way to make sure people are seeing your most important messages um, at the right moment in time. And we recently launched um, keyword targeting, um, which has all kinds of implications. If someone says, I'm looking for colored jeans, a retailer who sells colored jeans could target someone with a promoted tweet in that moment in time. Okay, final question before we, we, we actually conveniently moves us to Netflix, actually. Yeah. But uh, your acquisition recently of Bluefin yeah. for $90 million. Yeah. Um, I don't know how many people were aware of the Bluefin acquisition from Twitter in the room here. Um, one. All okay. right, okay. So <laughs> maybe this is a very good opportunity, therefore, <laughs> Uh, to explain explain to the audience, you know, mm -hmm. what does Bluefin do? It's yeah. a curious acquisition, isn't it, for Twitter? And how is it going to um, give you a, a better story pre your IPO? So we've seen that there's a great correlation between Twitter and TV. 95% um, of the public conversation about TV happens on Twitter. 50% of the people on Twitter tweet while they're watching TV. Um, Bluefin is a group of MIT um, PhDs who have done some really interesting things in terms of looking at behaviors and, and that, that correlation and causation that we're seeing happen. Um, all kinds of implications. Um, we're, we're in the exploring stages in terms of the kinds of products and things that we'll develop with them. Um, but what we're seeing from our most sophisticated brands and, and agency partners is that more and more people are coming to us um, with their social and digital media buyers and their TV buyers hand in hand um, because it's, okay. it's no longer Twitter or TV, it's, it's Twitter and TV. Um, and so if you spend on TV, uh, there's a strong, strong uh, case to spend on Twitter to amplify that. So what, what you're talking about here is some sort of affinity analysis yeah. opportunity. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for that. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. So, um, Luke, thank you very much for coming all the way uh, over to Montreux. Welcome. Um, now, you're the, you're the chief marketing officer of Netflix. Your challenge is to <laughs> position um, this brand in the Latin American market. But the first question really is just about Netflix as a media, as a medium, if you like, or channel itself. A disruptive model, particularly for many of the people who are, who are advertisers in the audience, um, uh, because obviously you don't carry ads. Um, you've started to make a profit. Q1 was a billion dollars of revenue. That's right. Um, so it's looking good. What's the vision that Netflix has for its global global brand? Are you going to take over the TV? Yeah. Are you going to are you going to ruin the business models of Televisa in, in Mexico and ITV in the UK? You no, know, but we look at uh, at uh, internet television as the future of, of television, right? So you look at streaming video on demand and how people are going to consume uh, entertainment. It's, it's going to be via the internet, and we're well positioned to be the global dominant player, and we've, we're the leader in the US. We've, we've launched recently in Latin America with, with IMS. We're, we're in the UK and Ireland. Uh, we're in four countries in the Nordics. Um, and as you mentioned, we came off a strong quarter with a billion dollars in revenue. And um, the service is a great option for, for consumers in terms of watching as much as they want, anywhere they want, on any device they want. So in that sense, it is disrupting. It's, it's revolutionary in terms of how people are, are consuming content. You, you have 36 million members right now. Right. Um, where do you see that you know, moving in a, in a year's time? What kind of projections are you, are you, are you expecting? Well, we've, year over year, we've seen uh, consistent growth. Um, last year was a strong quarter. Uh, in the U.S., we have 29 million. Uh, of that 36 million, 7 million are, are international. So our growth is going to come from international. So as we talk about this panel in terms of uh, crossing frontiers and crossing borders, um, 
most companies, global companies, the majority of their users and their profits are not inside the US, right? We're a US-based company, and you look at YouTube, for example, 80% of their, their, their views are outside of the US. Yeah. Skype, 80% of their, their revenue are, are outside of the US. So for us, the growth is going to come from international markets, and LATAM in particular is, is a very big market that, that we're very keen on. Interesting, well, let, let's, let's, um, let, let's look at Latin America. Obviously, all eyes are upon that continent right now. Uh, Marin, IMS I, I may not be known to everyone in the audience, so to explain, explain a little bit about, about what you do. Sure. Uh, IMS is a media and marketing company that partners with businesses looking to expand into Latin America or within Latin America. And uh, we offer business and media services. On the business side, it could be an array of services such as research, insight, uh, consultative, um, consultative insights into how to grow within Latin America, the right kind of structure, uh, tax regulations, et cetera. And on the media side, we offer an array of services from premium display to performance marketing, search, social, mobile, et cetera. Uh, we partner with companies such as Twitter for their expansion of their promoted products plat uh, platform into Latin America, where they're exclusive partner in the region, as well as Netflix, uh, where they're digital agency of record in Latin America. Today we have about 150 employees in seven offices across seven countries with our headquarters in Miami. And we certainly see tremendous amount of growth as, uh, as Luke referred to within Latin America. So, you know, in these past years, I'm based in the Buenos Aires office, in the Argentina office, and I've been there for about four years. And during that time, we've really seen sustained GDP, macroeconomic growth across the key markets in Latin America. So we're talking about Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, Colombia, Chile, Peru, and even Venezuela. And, and with, of course, that sustained macroeconomic growth comes advertising growth. And, and in Latin America, uh, we see that, we see about a 10% uh, projected advertising investment compared to approximately 4% global growth, much of that propelled by digital, really, where we're looking at 20, 20 plus percent growth over the next year or so compared to about 10% on a global level. Interesting. So, so Luke, as a, as, a, as a marketer trying to establish the Netflix brand uh, in, in Latin America, you know, most of the, your global advertising is performance-based. Now, most people would think that in Latin America, with, with such a dominant TV industry, with the likes of Globo and Brazil and Televisa and so on in Mexico, um, that, that digital take-up might prohibit your performance model on that continent. Is that, is that the case? No, that's not necessarily the case. Actually, in any market we're in, uh, digital represents a very large uh, portion of the, the marketing mix. Right? So we're, we advertise on, on digital, display, search, uh, online video, rich media. But how do the metrics from Latin America compare to the metrics of the rest of the world? Um, it's, it's, any market we're in is, is uh, we, we have a very strong uh, direct response campaigns. We, we also advertise on, on broadcast television, um, but in terms of how things differ you know, market by market, in, in LATAM we do see generally typically higher <coughs> click-through rates than let's say in, in Europe or the US. Um, but we measure beyond the click, obviously. We, we take a look at you know, what is the impact of people viewing the ad and eventually uh, subscribing. And, and so, you know, what, what sort of, how do the, the rates and the metrics, so your conversion rate um, across the world, you know, how, how does that work? And give us a sense of, um, you know, the amount of investment in digital channels, how, how, how does that convert into ultimate su subscribers on the channel? And, and uh, the metrics you see in Latin America, are they, are they different? Sure. Uh, in terms of rates, uh, obviously, in, in LATAM, media is generally probably cheaper than, than you may see. So, so you may, may see CPMs that are slightly lower than, let's say, Europe or the U.S., which actually, for, for us, is an interesting place to experiment, right? We can, we can take some of that budget and put it into ad units that we may not have, have had the opportunity to do in other markets. And if we seek success, then we can take those uh, case studies and bring them to, to other markets. So, um, and then on the conversion rate side, obviously, one of the challenges in, in Latin America is method of payment, right? So we may not see as high a conversion rate. Um, you know, not as many people are familiar with are comfortable with paying online. They may not have a credit card. They, they, they may not have the right type of uh, debit card that accepts recurring uh, yeah. e-commerce transactions. So that's one of the things that we've been working very hard with, uh, with local banks and, and, and providers to enhance the, the method of payment. It's interesting you mentioned Latin America as a test market. You know, you've got, you've got big organizations like uh, Interpublic Group with a lot of the creative development happening in the Latin, Latin continent. Um, and, then, and then expanding it overseas. That's something we, we, we're seeing. 
with regards to, to Twitter, I mean, you, you yeah. chose to launch your, one of your first sort of external sales offices in, in Latin America. Is, that, is there a sense of trialing it because they're just a very social population? I mean, it's, it's hugely social. Yeah, yeah. 16% um, of our user base um, is, is in Latin America and fast pace of growth there as well. Um, mobile was a key consideration, so 60% of Twitter's users um, log in via mobile. Um, more often than not, our mobile products outperform our desktop products. Um, because of the simplicity of that design, it plays really well on mobile. Um, so those were key considerations. Um, in, you know, the aggressive click-through rates, um, we see ads performing there incredibly well. So we, um, we, we uh, partnered with IMS and have been selling promoted products um, there uh, in every country but Brazil. Brazil, we have our own office um, since September. Uh, and they have, I, I can't even describe how, um, how much they've surpassed our expectations in terms of how users are engaging, how um, ads are performing, um, the excitement from, from brands and, and agencies in the market, and, and frankly, revenue. Yeah. So roughly, of, of, of your 200, sorry, I was just saying, of your sort of 200 million users, how many are currently, say, in, in Brazil? So we can't break it out country by country, unfortunately. Why, why, why don't you do that? Twitter rules, yeah, yeah, as a private company. Would you like them to break it out by country? <laughs> With strategic partners, tweet, tweet, we, tweet we that. let them know those things. <laughs> we would like Twitter to break it out by a few countries. Yeah, yeah, sorry. It's okay. Okay, okay, fair enough. Sorry, Marin. I was going to say that I, perhaps what, what people may not realize is that really when we look at Latin America as a whole, social media penetration, you know, we have more than 90% of internet users are on social media. When it comes to mobile, there's more than 100% uh, mobile penetration in the region. And so when we look at these kind of disruptive technologies that you're mentioning, uh, certainly Netflix online video consumption is, is very strong, mm -hmm. social and mobile, which are, which are critical for, for Twitter and the second screen type of interactions are, are really growing very consistently within Latin America. And so it's, as companies look to grow outside of perhaps core markets such as the US and Europe, Latin America is, is a natural place to, to start investing. Uh, and we have certainly seen that with other companies looking to come into the region. Waze, the number one uh, mobile app now in the world, is partnering with IMS to launch their monetization strategy as of this June. Spotify recently announced its entry into the market. Evernote opened a Brazil office recently. And so for these fast moving, particularly digital or, or tech type platforms, Latin America is really a natural because of these growths that we see. Let's talk a little bit about the upcoming World Cup. Uh, I know that you're going to have a session uh, after the break where we're going to understand a little bit more about the interrelationships between tweets, uh, athletics, uh, the, the participants, the sportsmen, the sponsors, and how that, all that interaction benefits brands, uh, which I think will be fascinating. But you know, give us a sense of you know, what your expectations are in terms of the World Cup, you know, in terms yeah. of income from brands. Do you see, will you see a surge? And also the use of, of yeah. Twitter as, as a platform around... Um, that's an amazing sporting occasion. Have you got any projections you can share with us? Sure. So um, part of our market development strategy um, is tied to sports um, because, uh, you know, again, when events happen and that public conversation and that opportunity to connect to people um, who are talking about that same moment in time, whether it was a goal or a, a bad call on a play, um, is a really compelling experience. And so we saw with the Olympics, um, you know, that uh, Twitter helped build the roar of the crowd. We gave NBC, the president of NBC is quoted as saying, we gave them the best ratings that they've had since the 70s because of the Twitter integration. And so you think about advertisers who are sponsors or who want to participate in that conversation, and that's a huge opportunity. So right now we're having a lot of great conversations with brands and thinking about what we do with how people behave and, and knowing again the public conversation about football is going to happen on Twitter. And who's the largest brand spender on Twitter globally and, and who's the largest spender in Latin America? I can't share that. <laughs> who, who, um, which category of advertising um, is, is the most important on Twitter right now? I mean, I, you know, we see that our, our biggest advertisers really are spanning verticals. It, it's it's I, you know, it's auto, it's telecom, it's it's retail. Um, in that order? N no. Oh, sorry. <laughs> just, just, uh... <laughs> okay. 
going to have to watch you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Luke, um, the, the World Cup for Netflix presents <clears throat> presumably a, a, a challenge as, as well as a, an opportunity. You know, there's going to be a, a huge amount of viewing on, on, on established traditional um, operators, the cable companies particularly. Um, how, does, how does a company, you know, make, it, make a noise during, during that time? Sure, for us, um, Netflix is all about movies and TV shows, so not necessarily sports content. So it actually serves as a great opportunity for counter-programming. So um, for, for the folks who, who aren't going to be attending or, or watching the, the events, the, the Olympics and, and the World Cup. But in terms of opportunity, uh, Brazil and the, and the government in Brazil is, is building out infrastructure, investing heavily, and, and we're getting in there now to help us establish a, a foothold, um, getting, getting kind of first market mover advantage and establish the brand now because we know that over the next five years as we go from you know, LADAM as a whole being 50 million broadband households, um, it's, it's going to grow 70% over the next five years, so close to 90 million uh, broadband households by 2018. When we compare that to other markets, uh, the growth rate is, is, is about 20% over that five year span. So we're we're very keen to to take advantage of, of that uh, market so, so opportunity. You, so, so not just in Latin America, presumably globally, you have some projections that really are coattailing your growth on the back of broadband. Sure. Yeah. Exactly. And, and where do you see, in terms of total number of you you know users with with broadband access, Latin America and beyond globally? You know, where where do you do you see that number rising? You know, hugely. What what are your sure. own internal projections? On that? Yeah, we we do see that rising uh, rapidly. Um, you just look at. How, how we, we just launched uh, the streaming only plan in 2010, and then we launched in Canada and then Latin America. So it's really only been a few years that we've, we've offered the streaming only. Netflix originally was a DVD by mail company in the US um, for the past decade, and um, we've, we've really grown uh, kind of exponentially, and, and, and we continue to see that, that trend. Okay. Um, just a few minutes left before we welcome the CMO of SAB Miller, who's going to bring us back to basics. All this digital confusing affinity scoring, you know, it's uh, sometimes quite nice to hear people like Chuck Porter and, and uh, experienced CMOs say, actually, this is, this is how it is. I'm looking forward to that. So we have one final question, um, and it's to you, Marin. Um, you know, a lot of people in this audience are, are planning their strategy. Sure. Um, uh, with, with regards to the World Cup and the Olympics in, in Brazil, there's many global brands that are still trying to work out exactly what good looks like in, in, terms, of, uh, in terms of engagement. You know, what advice would you give uh, to brands in the audience as they, as they sort of start to pl plot this, uh, sure. this approach? I I think that you know when we think about Latin America, we tend to think of one region, and maybe it's a region that speaks Spanish and, and Portuguese, but, but many companies may consider it just as one homogenous region. It's very important to understand that Latin America has many differences, many cultural differences, many differences in, in media consumption patterns from country to country. And so while Brazil is, is certainly on everyone's radar for, 20, 000, for 2014 and 2016, we do need to keep in mind that uh, media investment, um, advertising patterns are different and, and how we tailor those to speak to different consumers and how we engage them in conversations and in, uh, in media consumption really needs to defi be defined according to local preferences. And so that's something that IMS works very closely with Twitter, with Netflix, with our partners on to help brands truly be able to uh, sustain their growth, sustain their presence in the region. Uh, Brazil is, is very exciting. Uh, a lot of brands are already looking to invest, not just again in Brazil, but in Latin America for this time. Um, it's you know a little over a year away, but that comes up very quickly. And so we are uh, very excited. We do anticipate many more companies looking to enter the region in the coming 12 months, uh, as well as brands looking to expand their presence. Thank you. And please, all of you attend the uh, Twitter session in the break. Um, there's going to be some fantastic uh, statistics uh, in there. So, um, well, thank you very much, guys, for that uh, very interesting discussion around digital, around Latin America and the changes that are taking place. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please thank our three panellists. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Mm.